Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. I had a few weeks off from presenting the news thanks to getting sick, then moving house, but I am back with a few episodes before Computex kicks off in a little over a week. As Computex is so close, there haven't been many PC hardware product launches this week because they're all being safe for Computex, but there's still some interesting topics. So, well, let's get into it. Everyone watching this video, I'm sure, is super excited to see what AMD has in store for us with their upcoming third generation Ryzen CPUs and Navi GPUs. There have been a few leaks floating around the place giving supposed specifications for some CPU models, but haven't been able to conclusively verify that stuff yet, so not going to be the focus of this video. With that said, AMD has confirmed at their annual shareholder meeting that both third gen Ryzen and their all new Navi GPU architecture on 7 nanometer will debut in Q3 2019. I don't think this will come as a surprise to anyone. Q3 has been right on the mark for some time now and fits in nicely with their launch event plans over the coming weeks. Speaking of launch events, there are two events coming up for AMD that will be of interest. One is at Computex, their keynote there, which was announced a while ago. And just this week, AMD officially announced their second event, Next Horizon Gaming, at E3 on June 10th. Like the Computex event, AMD's E3 keynote will be live streamed, so you will get all the news as it's announced. We're not 100% sure what will be shown at either of these events, but considering the E3 event is just a few weeks after the Computex event, you'd have to expect a neat split of announcements between the two. Considering Computex will have a lot of X570 stuff from motherboard partners, CPUs would likely be the focus of that event, so hopefully we will get Ryzen 3000 information there. And then at E3, we're probably looking at the GPU side of things with Navi, not just for discrete cards, but also for consoles, given the technology will be used in upcoming devices from Sony and presumably Microsoft as well. Exciting times for AMD fans and for the industry in general, always nice to get some major product launches to spice things up for the second half of the year. In not as good news, Intel has been hit with another security flaw originating from speculative execution. Once again, a bit of a disclaimer here because I'm not a security expert, so I suggest reading the original article from Ars Technica and others that go into more detail, but I'll try my best to summarize the issues here. What we are looking at are three new flaws, namely RIDL or RIDL, there's Fallout and Zombie Load, and they are all closely related to the original speculative execution issues from January last year called Meltdown and Spectre. The more technical name for the new flaws is Microarchitectural Data Sampling, or MDS. It has to do with gathering data from buffers within the processor and exploiting how those buffers are utilized for speculative execution. While any sort of hardware related flaw is bad news, one positive is that actually using these flaws for nefarious purposes is difficult and would require many attempts to gather enough usable data and sort through that data from the rubbish. That's because there is not much control over what appears in the buffers that MDS exploits. Researchers from VU Amsterdam did show a proof of concept attack where a password file could be read via MDS. However, the attack required the system to run a command repeatedly so that the right data would appear in the buffers. Intel says that MDS is already addressed at the hardware level in many of our recent 8th and 9th gen Intel core processors, which basically means Coffee Lake and Whiskey Lake. Anything before that is vulnerable though, and Intel are pushing out microcode updates for Sandy Bridge and up to address the problem. There are a few other interesting tidbits surrounding this story. The first is that Pharonix did some testing on Linux with the Core i9-7980XE, a vulnerable Skylake X CPU, to see what the performance impacts are from software side and microcode mitigations. Intel said it should be under 3% for the most part, although in some workloads it could be higher. Phronix found similar, there were a few tests where the performance difference was massive, but a regular impact was maybe up to 5% or so. I did also see a report claiming that Intel tried to bribe VU Amsterdam into downplaying the severity of the vulnerabilities. However, when looking into it, I'm not sure whether bribe is the right word to use here. The source is an article translated from Dutch, which seems to suggest that Intel attempting to pay out via their bug bounty program and that payment being refused constitutes a bribe. The article also claims that VU forced Intel to reveal this flaw now rather than six months later. Not really sure what the situation is there. Anyway, enough about this issue. I don't think many consumer platforms will opt to include the microcode fixes given the difficulty of attack. So I don't think there will be many performance considerations for everyday users. And apparently the latest chips are safe anyway. As for AMD, they've already stated that their CPUs are not vulnerable to this sort of attack. And I believe it's the same for ARM chips as well. In other news, a Tech Power Up forum member allegedly found references to both the Radeon RX 640 and Radeon 630 in the latest drivers. These are said to be straight rebrands of 
the RX 550X and Radeon 540X. So nothing at all exciting here whatsoever, but it does bring into question what AMD might use as a name for their next generation GPUs. Will they stick with an RX 600 series for mid-range products or choose to use RX 3000 like has been heavily rumored? We'll have to wait and see on that one. This is a story from a couple of weeks ago that just happened to pop up in my timeline now. And what is a bit of a surprise, Samsung is set to discontinue their popular B-Die 8 gigabit memory chips in the second quarter of 2019, which is, well, I guess it's right now. There is no firm date set for their demise, but in Samsung's latest DDR4 SDRAM component product guide, B-Die is listed as end of life, while other dies, including C-Die and D-Die in 8 gigabit capacities, and A-Dies for 16 gigabit and 32 gigabit are living on. B-Dies were very popular for high-end memory because of their excellent quality and ability to clock high with good timings. A lot of people when building a new system specifically seek out B-Dies for their memory to ensure the best performance. With B-Dies getting discontinued, it's only a matter of time before they disappear from the market completely, and who knows how many modules have been stopped stockpile at the big DIMM manufacturers. It'll also be interesting to see where the next generation of high performance memory chips are coming from, whether that's a different Samsung die or perhaps from a different manufacturer. So there's definitely interesting times ahead for the DRAM market. There's also been an interesting turn of events with the launch of Rage 2. And I'm not really talking about the mixed reviews here, but more the situation with the DRM. Users quickly discovered that if you bought Rage 2 on Steam, you would have had to deal with Denuvo DRM, which is one of the most notorious DRM technologies out there. But if you bought the game through Bethesda's store and used their launcher, you were playing with a version of the game that did not include Denuvo. Whether or not there is any performance difference between the versions remains to be seen, and it could offer a good test platform to finally see whether Denuvo really has the big performance impact a lot of people claim. But in the meantime, the developers of Rage 2 noticed the discrepancy between the versions, and well, luckily instead of just adding it to the Bethesda version, they did in fact remove Denuvo from the Steam version, so at least that's a positive result for gamers. Hot Chips in 2019 is heating up to be one of the most exciting shows in years for fans of various hardware architectures. The event, which is held in August and known for its in-depth insights into chip technologies, has a schedule that's absolutely jam-packed with talks from all the major companies on all their major technologies. Looking through the schedule as kindly posted by Nantech, we can see that AMD are talking about Zen 2 Matisse very early on day one and will also deliver a keynote address. Whether or not we get new insights here will depend on whether AMD will launch Zen 2 before August, but you'd think so at this point. Then later we have talks from Intel on Optane, TSMC on their No technology, Intel again on 3D packing in Lakefield, and talks from both Nvidia and AMD on their Turing and Navi architecture. So definitely fun times ahead. The Epic Game Store, everyone's second least favorite game store after the Microsoft Store, of course, has launched its first ever sale in an attempt to win people over. Everything on the store priced over $15 has received at least a $10 discount, including for pre-order games like Borderlands 3, although we still don't advise pre-ordering anything at this stage. There are other deals on there like Metro Exodus for nearly half price, it's not quite there, but considering the store doesn't have anywhere near the amount of games as Steam and is still trying to gain market share, I don't think we'll see any Steam-like super sales for a little while. That said, it's a good start and it's worth a browse if there are any Epic exclusives that interest you in particular. Lastly, we have a bit of a monitor story for you. As spotted by TFT Central, the new ASUS Tough Gaming VG32VQ is the first monitor on the market to support both variable refresh rates and backlight strobing blur reduction at the same time. There have been plenty of monitors that include both features, but to enable one, you had to disable the other. So for those that like the increased clarity of backlight strobing, you could only run it at a fixed refresh rate. The VG32VQ has a new mode called ELMB Sync, with ELMB standing for Extreme Low Motion Blur, which is basically ASUS's brand name for backlight strobing. Here you can combine adaptive sync at up to 144Hz with backlight strobing, although presumably there is going to be a high minimum refresh as backlight strobing often isn't very effective below 100Hz, the flicker becomes too obvious, so it will be interesting to see how they handle that. It's also interesting to see ASUS expand the tough gaming brand to include monitors. So hopefully we'll be able to get that one into review in the coming months. Anyway, that's it for this week's News Corner. One more of these to go next week before the big show of the year in Computex. Both Steve and I will be flying over to Taiwan to give you all the news and tidbits from there. Subscribe to get News Corner in your inbox approximately every week, I guess, except for the last three weeks or so. And of course, we have a Patreon page as well for you to enjoy. I'll catch you in the next one.